Okay, and now we have our research update from Prilinia Therapeutics with the esteemed Dr. Michael Hayden. We'll talk about a bit about his story and what the update is from Prilinia's end. Well, I'm so delighted to talk to everybody today. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, to talk to HDO. Uh, I know that you're uh, present in over 40 countries globally. So this is really an amazing organization that really uh, plays uh, uh, um, and supports uh, families and people, younger people all over the world. As part of today, uh, I thought I would share with you a little bit about my own history, where it started, how I got involved uh, in learning and working with families with Huntington disease many years ago, and then go on to share with you uh, the update on the Proof HD, the trial that's the most furthest along in terms of looking at maintaining function in HD. So as I look back where my own journey began, I was actually born in Cape Town, South Africa, uh, actually on that mountain, Table Mountain. And uh, very early on as a medical student, I started becoming aware of families with Huntington disease. These families were disenfranchised by the stigma uh, of this disease. Uh, they were also disenfranchised for many of them were mixed descent. And I ended up being able to visit really thousands of families all throughout South Africa at a time we, I was told that Huntington disease did not exist in Africa, but it certainly existed and left families uh, with tremendous stress, pressure, uh, and difficulties. What I learned also was uh, learning about, and you can see this is a, a picture of me actually, and you can see that this is some time ago, the hairstyle's a little different, um, but I was inspired by my contact with these families, the warmth, the dignity, the courage, the resilience, the optimism uh, really inspired me and inspired me also to continue on this lifelong journey, which is to find some way to alleviate the suffering of uh, families with HD. As part of this journey, in the late 70s, I met Marjorie Guthrie. And having already been in some difficulty with the politics of South Africa, Marjorie encouraged me uh, to come to North America, uh, to America, and help me uh, with visas and getting a permanent residence and a new status to come to North America. And as you know, Marjorie Guthrie is the founder of, of uh, HDSA uh, and, uh, and became almost like a mother to me over that period. So I went from the University of Cape Town uh, and the first, the hospital where the first heart transplant in the world happened, went straight to Harvard Medical School, Children's Hospital, continued studying at the Brigham and Women's, and then went to UBC in Canada, also worked at Teva, where uh, we also developed the drug that is Ostedo, available in the United States. And from Teva, we founded Prelenia. Prelenia being focused on families with neurodegenerative disorders, particularly Huntington disease and ALS. So when we look at Huntington disease, as you all know, uh, the drug that was uh, essentially approved uh, uh, while I was at Teva, which was deuterated tetrabenazine and then tetrabenazine before, only two drugs approved for Huntington disease. And both of them deal with chorea to decrease the career, the abnormal movements. But when you talk to families and you look at the, the, the issue and the progression that is most problematic is decrease in function. Functional abilities go down quite early and continue to progress uh, until patients are bedridden in the later phases of the illness. Now, Huntington disease at the cellular level influences multiple pathways. So that expanded repeat in the Huntington gene leads to decreased clearance of proteins, decreased energy, stress. It also decreases protective factors in the brain, decreases calcium transport, breaks down the 
spines that occur in Huntington disease that are crucial for cognitive impairment. So spines are decreased and there are billions of spines and also is inflammatory. And this results in neuronal degeneration with the resultant decrease in function, motor, cognitive, psychiatric, and behavioral symptoms. Now, the drug that I'm talking about today is predopidine. This is an investment drug in, for Huntington's and ALS. I really brought this drug into Teva because I was interested in how this drug works. Initially, this drug was thought to have specific impact on dopamine receptors. Today, the biology is much more understood, and we now know that this is what's called a sigma-1 receptor agonist. It binds and activates sigma-1. It's very safe and tolerable. It's been given to many, many patients. It's administered orally, and that's very important to make it accessible to patients. And in, pre in previous studies, this is the first drug that is ever shown in a post hoc analysis in early HD that total functional capacity can be maintained. And there is some evidence that this effect may be enduring up to five years. So these are the things that matter. Predopinine gets into the brain and binds the sigma-1 receptor at the therapeutic dose. And how do we know that? We know that because when you give a ligand, something that binds the sigma-1 receptor, which is called flusbidine, you then see this as a labeled ligand in the brain. Then you pre-treat with your drug and you see how much of it is decreased or mitigated. And here you can see remarkably that predopidine, if you pre-treat and then give flusbidine, you decrease completely the binding. This shows that this is strong and selective binding to the sigma-1 receptor. And so the mechanism of action of this drug is not a dopamine modulator, but rather is at these therapeutic doses is a drug that binds sigma-1. Now we've gone on to show that the sigma-1, of course, is a protein highly expressed in the brain. The, its activation plays a key role in uh, in essentially uh, uh, de uh, providing neuroprotection. It's neuroprotective. And, and this has pathways that are significant and enhances removal of proteins that are toxic, increases mitochondrial function, decreases stress, enhances some of the neuroprotective factors, increases the regulation of calcium, improves the connectivity and decreases inflammation. And there's lots of data from many parts of the world to show that this is active only in the presence of sigma-1. So here you can see, for example, in cells that are taken from the striatum in patients, in animals with Huntington disease compared to wild type, these cells die much earlier. And here you can see if you treat with predopidine, you can completely protect them from cell death. However, if you remove just one gene from these mice, you lose the effect completely. So this means that this acts completely through the sigma-1 receptor. Now, we then, with this new information and learning opening to open to the new data, this led us to different approaches to design a trial that we'd look at function of Huntington disease. And the FDA looked at our design and the data and granted us something very special, which is fast track designation in November last year. And the benefits for this are that we have more frequent meetings with the FDA. We have more frequent communication. This makes us eligible for accelerated approval and priority review. And it allows us to start submitting data to the FDA even before we get the results of proof. Now, the important issue that also motivated me as I learned and spoke to families uh, over many decades is that decreased functional capacity is the major burden on daily life. They emphasize this, the ability to continue to perform daily activities, stay independent, manage finance, continue to work and, and, and play with their families. And as the disease progresses, 
uh, the patients become increasingly dependent. And total functional capacity is measures the capacity of patients to work, perform household activities, manage finances, take care of themselves. And this major burden in functional decline can be measured by TFC, and this is the primary endpoint in PROOF. And PROOF stands for predominant outcome of, uh, of function in Huntington disease. That's what PROOF stands for. So total functional capacity is a validated. The regulators accept this as a single primary endpoint. It, uh, for the FDA, it's the preferred endpoint. It measures the ability to stay working, to manage finances, to do activities at home, to look after yourself, go to the washroom, brush your teeth, uh, take care of yourselves, and who takes care of you. And this is ranged from zero to 13, and 13 would be early, very early in the first phase of Huntington disease. And this goes down about one a year as you go on. So TFC is widely accepted and accepted, as I said, by the regulators. And BFARM, this is the Europeans told us that it's meaningful and acceptable. It's acceptable primary endpoint and has been around for a long time. And any beneficial effect in the TFC is considered clinically meaningful because there is no drug that's ever been shown to have any impact. Now, what we know about TFC is that in Huntington disease and in the early phases, TFC shows a stable decline. And this has been seen in many different studies. And what we showed essentially, uh, so, uh, early evidence, is that predopidine may show maintenance of TFC at 52 weeks. So this was exciting. And this data encouraged us to go out and raise support uh, and inspire some to recognize that changing functional capacity and maintaining function in Huntington disease, there, this was a mission that moved from impossible now to possible. We had some evidence that this might work. And so that allowed us to then plan a phase three clinical study, which allowed us to assess that in a rigorous clinical trial. The maintenance of functional capacity was really just driven primarily by patients with early HD. Uh, and this was a, an analysis that wasn't pre-specified, but here you can see patients with early HD compared to those uh, on placebo, these were maintained, whereas on placebo, patients went down. And these appear to be effects that may have been maintained even over a longer period of time. So what we see here is that also, this also had some impact on motor function. The TMS was not significant in the study which measures motor function, but another sensitive measure was assessed and seen in this trial and correlated with uh, improvements in TFC. So here you can see QFC, the TFC looking, uh, the TMS, the Q motor, here you can see in the placebo group, it went down. And in the treated group, it really, in early HD, uh, it seemed to be maintaining function. So uh, this is important. Important also that predopidine has an extensive safety profile. This has been around a long time, uh, been treated in about 1,300 patients, and has had a profile uh, that is look, it looks uh, 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 generally the side effect profile comparable to placebo. And these are some of the side effects that have been seen. Uh, but as you can see, compared to placebo in these common side effects, these, there was no increase in the incidence of some of the side effects. So predopidine is this phase three clinical trial on predopidine's outcome on function in HD. This is now ongoing. We will get results in the early part of 2023. And at the moment, this study is fully enrolled. Uh, the primary objective is to examine the effect of predopidine on functional decline. It's a phase three double blind placebo controlled trial. And we were able to actually recruit, we initially had planned for 
480 patients. And remarkably, in this period, uh, 499 patients were uh, enrolled. Uh, and then there's an open label study where patients can actually go, subjects can go into the open label study thereafter. So right now, um, we have a, a patient retention is very high, 97%. Uh, there are no safety signals uh, that are of any concern. And this study is continuing uh, as we talk right now. Now, this particular study is done. Uh, the investigators, the key investigators, it's a partnership with the Huntington Study Group. Uh, and the uh, investigators include uh, the lead investigator, principal investigator in North America is Dr. Andrew Fagan, who's the chair of the Huntington Study Group. A co-PI is Dr. Sandra Kostick, who's a professor of neurology at Ohio State. In Europe, the PI is Dr. Ralph Friedman, the founding director and CEO of the George Huntington Institute. And the co-PI is Dr. Anne Rosser, who's chair of the European Huntington Disease Network. So we're excited and pleased to be able to uh, have this study ongoing in an effort to see whether this tolerable drug can replicate the findings that we saw in an earlier study uh, to have impact on total functional capacity. The study has been uh, uh, recognized in numerous ways. For example, there was a article in Nature Medicine that just recently spoke about trials that will shape medicine in 2022. And they identified proof as one of clinical trials that had the potential uh, to have that effect. And, and certainly when we also look, and we uh, predominant is still uh, one of the most advanced studies. And I want to just thank everybody. Uh, thank our partners for the ongoing partnership and collaboration. Also to all of you and families around the world and participants and families for their trust and ongoing collaboration. And so I would say, when I started seeing patients with Huntington disease really a long time ago, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, we would have thought that it would be mission impossible to have in a drug that had, it was a great hope but mission impossible with nothing on the horizon that had the potential uh, to uh, have impact on functional status in HD. Today, uh, Prolenia is the most advanced. Uh, we're doing a rigorous trial. One cannot always be sure that from a phase two study where you have some suggestions that a phase three study will be successful. And that's why we're engaged in a formal uh, uh, study uh, to assess whether this drug has the impact on maintaining, maintaining function in HD. This has been not a, uh, this has been a continuous journey of discovery as we learned about these drugs. And I'm very grateful for the support of HDO and, and thank you all for being partners. And this has been allowed us to understand more about the drug uh, and essentially uh, be able to design a trial that was rigorous uh, and able to uh, uh, assess this. And, you know, um, this, uh, we recognize that every day matters and every week matters. And that's why we were so thrilled to see that this, this trial recruited uh, very quickly ahead of schedule despite COVID and, uh, and essentially uh, um, this represents an, 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 a very wonderful ongoing partnership and collaboration with HD families around the world. So I want to thank you for your attention and look forward to having some questions now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hayden, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, there don't seem to be any questions, so I'll just start off with one. Are you envisage the development of uh, predopidine going with regards to the total landscape of HG trials? Do you see it as another developing weapon in the arsenal or something to add on to current treatments that are uh, in clinical trials? Or yeah. do you intend for it to be like a standalone medicine on its own? Well, uh, 
That's a great question, Mustafa. Thank you for that. Predopamine is the most advanced, being in phase three clinical trials. So if we were successful, and that's what a phase three trial is designed to assess, uh, this would be the only drug that is uh, available, hopefully globally, to uh, have impact on function in HD. However, um, just as in other serious disorders, and in other neurodegenerative disorders, we would see combination therapy being profound. We very much believe in Huntington lowering as another strategy. And the combination of therapies uh, would be a, a very bene potentially beneficial. We would have to assess that. Let me just say an oral drug that is safe and tolerable, that has got a long-term history would be a big advantage. Uh, certainly, there are oral drugs now that are in development that could have impact on Huntington lowering, and there'd be no reason that they couldn't be used in combination therapy uh, for families and patients. And of course, if it's safe and tolerable, and if we are able to uh, show that this drug is neuroprotective, this, of course, may be useful also as protective therapy even before people manifest with the illness. So this is something still to be taken and still to be proven. But of course, the opportunity to assess that would be done after we, if we have shown that this is useful in patients with early HD. So also in addition, in this trial, patients who are on Ostero or tetrabenazine, this is not an exclusion in the trial. And there are a number of patients who are on both therapies. They work in, com in different mechanisms and for different symptoms. Ostero, for example, is useful for chorea, but has no effect on function in HD. It does not slow down progression as measured by TFC. So we believe combination therapy is likely to be uh, a very much a feature of this disease and treatment uh, of families with this illness but we still have to see that these drugs, both predopidine as well as others, can truly be shown to be effective in rigorous clinical trials. And so I would say today, uh, there's lots of hope. The different mechanism being explored. We cannot always, it's not always predictable which drugs will work. One needs to be very open to different mechanisms. And in the end, hopefully, there'll be combination therapy that works on different mechanisms to have impact on this illness. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, the clinical trial landscape has come a long way for, because you've been around for a long time. Have you seen the development going? Because I think even 10 years ago, there was only one or two clinical trials and now there's like five or six ongoing. Uh, what do you think is in store for the HD community over the coming years? Well, I think it's, it's, it's a great time. You know, and I do believe we have to think about multiple mechanisms. We also have to think about mode of administration. You know, giving something, for example, intrathecal may work, but the problem is there's not the infrastructure globally to deliver drugs intrathecally yet. They could be with time. In addition, so I think that there are multiple mechanisms that are being assessed, some very early, just remember, it can take up to 10 years uh, to develop a drug. But the good news is that the pharmaceutical and biotech industry is playing a role now and is very aware of HD. And that's good news. Also, Huntington disease is seen as a model for other neurodegenerative disorders. A drug that's useful in HD may be useful in other disorders like ALS or even Alzheimer's disease. And if you have a neuroprotective drug, and just to say this drug that we're working on uh, was chosen in a global competition by our colleagues at Mass General and Harvard Medical School to be part of a platform trial in ALS. So this drug is currently also in a phase two, three trial in ALS uh, uh, and led by Merit Kudkovitz at Mass General Hospital. So it is likely that there will be drugs uh, more, more, there are going to be more trials. And we believe that multiple flowers should bloom. You should have multiple approaches because we cannot predict with accuracy which work. And there are all kinds of reasons why drugs don't work. We have to be very open to new data. 
We have to have failures to lead us to new approaches. Our phase two clinical trial looking at the impact of predopidine on movement the t measured by TMS failed. But in that, we got early insights into the fact that the drug may be working in a totally different mechanism. So we have to be open to the new data. We cannot be fixed in our views. We have to let the data drive and the science and the biology drive the clinical design. And that's what we've done at Prelenia. Yeah, totally, totally agree. And that's what, the reason why we do clinical trials, such extensive clinical trials in the first place. Okay, I don't think there's any questions. So I just have one last one. How can we sort of bring a lot of these HG specific clinical trials to other traditionally underserviced part of the world? For example, Latin America doesn't get a lot of clinical trials. Asia as well is traditionally underrepresented in, ter in terms of the HD community. How do we get these patients access? Well, Mustafa, that's such an important point. And certainly uh, for an oral drug, uh, having, uh, they may be uh, an easier approach to have this accessible uh, in different parts of the world. But even more important that participating in the trial is making sure that if the drug is successful and approved, that this drug becomes available uniformly. And for an oral safe tolerable drug, this will be certainly much easier. We also have to make sure that the drug is not uh, too expensive in developed areas because otherwise this would not be available. So there are many barriers to access and certainly we have to be, take care that, um, that this doesn't become a barrier to providing support for families elsewhere. In the clinical trial, it's often difficult to have trials in very geographically disparate areas. Uh, language is an issue, everything has to be translated, it becomes much more expensive. So I would say, uh, let's get the trials done as rapidly and as efficiently as possible but then let's make sure that this is a global disease. And HDO knows that, spanning 40 countries. And let's work together to make sure this drug is accessible for the world if there's a drug that has impact on this illness. So I'm very, uh, I want to uh, make sure that that's uh, a case. And I, all I could say, you know, I started off learning about Huntington's disease in South Africa. It was a journey initially into the mind. But my impact and the impact with families changed that to a journey into the heart, a commitment lifelong to do whatever we can to have impact on this illness globally, including in Pakistan and everywhere else uh, where this will be needed. So that's the commitment. And I just hope that we have a drug that's uh, uh, available and useful and then the next step is making, taking steps to make sure that there's access to this drug uh, everywhere. Yeah, I, I'm hopeful that we're not too far away because over the last few years, I think there's been a huge push in terms of everyone in the HD community. We have, I think, one final question, which basically asks you to summarize how, I don't know if you can answer this question, but how is the safety data looking for the drug in phase three? Well, we're actually, again, very encouraged. Um, there've been, there's been a very low dropout rate, 97.5% retention. Now, I just want to say that in most Huntington trials, you end up having a dropout rate of 10 or 15%. So this is very low. And there have been no serious adverse events attributable to the drug. So um, this is uh, looking good. The trial's not done. We shouldn't, uh, uh, we can only go with the data we have. Uh, it doesn't mean there couldn't be some things happening later, but at the moment it's looking good. And remember the trial's already been running about 15 months and we have 499 patients randomized to this trial. Uh, and that would be in probably 250 patients per group, more or less. Mm -hmm. So we're encouraged. Uh, the data is encouraging, but we need to finish the trial in an effort to make pr pr uh, conclusions. Yep. Data from prior studies also showed the drug was safe and tolerable. Yeah, hopefully some real nice data comes out early next year, right? Exactly. All right, all right. Thank you, Dr. Hayden. I don't think there's any other questions. Thank you so much. You're a real HG superstar. The community really appreciates your efforts. Thank you, and thank you all. Yeah.
Okay, everyone, that brings us to the close of this session. Uh, we have a 15 minute break now. And after that, on track two, we have a session discussing, uh, track one, sorry, a session discussing what to do after testing negative. And you can come back here on track two as well, where I think we have a session on, uh, we have a research question and answer session with HG Buzz. All right.